Good morning. We're going to try this microphone out again and we'll see how it does. Uh, it seemed to go okay last week. Um, I want to start with a very big thank you for everybody who came out this week. I know some people came out not just yesterday for the fall cleanup day. Um, I really think that you can notice the difference um, out front and even in the sanctuary. The windows have been washed, the courtyard has been cleaned, um, and then there's lots of little things that you may not ever notice unless it never actually got done. So I just want to thank everybody who came out. Um, I had my two little helpers, I'll put helpers in quotes, with me yesterday. Um, I don't know how much they actually helped, but they had a very great time. Uh, my daughter was asking when we were going to do that again. So, um, I want to uh, let everybody know that there are uh, hard copies of the Tower Bell in the back of the sanctuary. You should have received one by email last week, um, but if you would like a hard copy, they are in the back. Um, and a reminder to, if you would like, a name included in our litany for those who have died this year on All Saints, All Souls service at the beginning of November. Be sure to get that name to Julie at the office. You can either call or send her an email um, by the Tuesday before that service. So that's Tuesday, October 27th. I want to thank Paula for being our liturgist today um, and remind you to reach out to Carol if you would like uh, to help out in November or December. Um, and then a few um, just things to note about our congregation. Uh, Marjorie Kozak asked for prayers for her mom, Marge, um, who has had a couple falls in the last week or so. Um, and she's doing okay, uh, but, um, but just, you know, a little bit of a cause for concern. Um, the last time the EMT came, uh, Marjorie said that they told her, um, you really have to listen and take it easy or you're not going to be able to live at home anymore. And, um, and I think she heard that from the EMT a little bit better than she had been hearing it from Marjorie. So um, uh, I also have a prayer request from Sue Saunders, um, whose sister, Joanne, is currently in the hospital for COVID. Um, she is um, on a kind of regular medical floor, but now her, um, her Sue's nephew, Joanne's son, David, is now also in the hospital and in the intensive care unit for COVID-related issues. Um, so prayers for them um, during this time and over this next week. Um, a couple other just notes, the Harvest In gathering is still going on with, um, with envelopes in the back. Um, and there is a session meeting after worship today. Um, and I don't think we said where we wanted to do that. Maybe the chapel, um, just you know who you are, we'll find each other after. Um, uh, and then with that, I also have a little um, introductory video today for the service. Um, the service is inspired um, by the Children's Defense Fund, um, who hold a Children's Sabbath weekend every year um, to kind of raise up issues related to um, children's needs and children in poverty specifically. Um, and so I just wanted to offer a little bit of an introductory video about what this organization is. number of people who are going around begging just to feed their children. And starvation is a major, major problem now. I was called to testify in Washington. I asked if they would come and see what was really going on, which was starvation and malnutrition and an attempt to make people leave the state if they were poor and black. And the committee, to my um, surprise, came. But Robbie Kennedy came with them, and he brought the press for the first time. I think, of course, Mr. Chairman, that this is a reflection on all of us in the country of 1967 and the most prosperous country in the world, that we would think that all of us would be able to provide for some of our citizens living in, in this part of the country. The Children's Friends Fund is the grandchild of the Poor People's Campaign that Dr. Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy uh, started before they were assassinated, and I was blessed to be the policy director for that Poor People's Campaign to um, continue the work 
and the dream and the vision of Dr. King to end poverty in America. I first heard of Marion back in 1960 when she was a student in Atlanta. And people would say, ask Marion, get in touch with Marion. She emerged as a leader, brave, courageous, just smart, real smart. She wanted to do something not just about civil rights, but about children, all children. And the first law that we um, were able to lead and get enacted in the Congress was the Educational Handicapped Children's Act. We've got millions and millions of children who have health care, and CDF has played a very key role in that. We've got early education investments and Head Start investments that have grown over the years. We've got after-school investments that have grown over the years. We've been able to make some cracks in decreasing child poverty. But one of the things we never do is we never give up. And I'm always reminding myself of Dr. King when he said that you must keep moving forward, that if you can't fly, you gotta drive, you can't drive, you gotta run. If you can't run, you gotta walk. And if you can't walk, you gotta crawl. We are not going to go backwards, we're gonna go forward. And then it's the job of the civil rights movement I don't know what a country would be like without the Children's Defense Fund. If Martin Luther King Jr. could come back and see what Marion Wright Elderman is doing, he would be very proud. And so I think this is another one of those defining times that offers all of us the opportunity to stand up, fight back, and to form that next movement to end poverty, to create jobs, to make sure that every child is educated. Children need a sense of hope the sense of, yes, I too can make a contribution. Yes, I am somebody, and I'm going to do my best. Well, this is the time for all of us to put aside all of our organizational stuff, to put aside all of our political stuff, and to figure out how we're going to come together to pass on a better country for our children than we inherited. And let us continue to worship God. Please join me for our call to worship. Gather our hearts, O God, knitting us together across differences and division to live with your compassion. Gather our minds, O God, from distractions and distance to focus on you and your children. Gather our wills, O God, to be strong and courageous in pursuit of your justice. Make us one in heart, mind, and spirit, as is we worship you on this children's Sabbath day. Come, let us worship God.
The grace of God overflows for us through Jesus Christ, who came into the world to save sinners. Remembering our baptism and trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins. God of infinite possibility, we confess that too often we are stuck in what is rather than working toward what could be. We doubt we could make a difference, and so we just try to get through the day. We become overwhelmed by pain, problems, and the pandemic, and want to hide our hearts, sit on our hands, wait for it to end. Forgive us, O oh God, for living too little in the largeness of your love. Fill us, we pray, with courage and compassion, vision and determination to embody your love. Seek your will <coughs> and strive your justice will enable all children to thrive, live with joy, in the fullness of love that you intend. These things we pray in the name of your child, Jesus. Amen. Behold, I make all things new. Friends, by the grace of God made known in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. As God has forgiven us, let us forgive one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. Please turn from your seats uh, and greet one another with signs of Christ's peace. Hi friends, today's children moment um, is in line with our worship this week, which is part of our children's Sabbath weekend. And what this means is it's a time for us to think about all of God's children, and especially those today who might not have as much as we have, who might be struggling with being poor, who might be struggling with having enough food to eat, or even having a home to sleep in. So the book that I'm gonna to read today is called I Have the Right to Be a Child. It's based on the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. Uh, and it was a time when the countries of the world came together to say every child should be able to have these things just because they are a child. Sadly, that doesn't mean that they do. 
But it's a good reminder for us about what we want all of God's children to be able to experience in this world. So let us read, I have the right to be a child. I am a child, with eyes, hands, a voice, a heart, and rights. I have the right to a first name, a last name, a family that smiles at me, and a country that I can call my home. I have the right to have enough food to eat and water to drink, so that I can grow. My favorite thing is an orange. You can eat it or drink its juice. I have the right to live under a roof, to be warm but not too hot, not to be poor and to have just enough of what I need, not more. I have the right to be cured with the best medicines that were ever invented, and to run and jump and climb and shout, it's so wonderful to feel good. I have the right to go to school without having to pay so that I can learn how birds or planes or poppy seeds fly. I have the same rights whether I am a girl or a boy. Boys and girls love to sing the same songs. I have exactly the same right to be respected, whether I am black or white, small or big, rich or poor, born here or somewhere else. I have the right to be helped by my grown-ups, my friends, and my country if my body doesn't work as well as other children's. I have the right to be free from any kind of violence, and no one has the right to take advantage of me because I am a child. No one. I have the right to go to school and to refuse to go to work. I'll choose a job when I've learned everything I want to know. I have the right to be protected by adults and to be sheltered from disasters under a great big umbrella, whether there's too much rain or because of other sad things. I have the right never to experience the storm of war or the thunder of weapons. I am afraid of guided missiles and smart bombs. I have the right to breathe clean air that's as pure as the blue sky or a newborn polar bear cub. I have the right to play, to create, to imagine, to make faces and to leap around, and also to have friends, because dancing alone isn't very much fun. I have the right to learn about friendship, peace, and respect for our planet and for each human being who lives on it, for each animal that inhabits it, for each plant that nourishes it. I have the right to express myself completely freely, to say what I truly think about everything, even if it doesn't always please my dad to say exactly how I feel even if it doesn't always please my mom. I have the right to all these rights just because I'm a child, especially if I live in one of the many states in the world that have agreed to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. When will all children everywhere really have their rights respected? Tomorrow? The day after tomorrow? In 20 years? We need our rights to be respected now, today, because it is right now, today, that we are children. Will you please pray with me? Dear God, we ask you to provide peace and stability, food and shelter for all of your children. Help us love all of your kids. Help us to create a world worthy of your image. Through all of this, we pray through your Son, your child, Jesus Christ. Alleluia. Amen. O God, 
Some of us come to this time from homes that have been too silent for so long. Other, uh, others of us come from nonstop noise and days of distraction. Whether from solitude or chaos, we long now to hear your word to us, for us. By the power of your spirit, give us the ears to hear, the hearts to feel, the spirits to respond to the word you have for us this day. Amen. This morning's gospel is from Luke chapter 18, 35 through 43. As he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard a crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Then he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he shouted even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me see again. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people when they saw it, praise God. Hear what the Holy Spirit is telling God's people. Good morning again. I have always had a special place in my heart for kids. Summers during college were spent uh, as a counselor at a camp at our church. After college, I spent time working with children with behavioral and emotional issues. And then I went into a classroom and taught for a few years. As a chaplain, I took a special interest in our hospital's pediatric wing. And I love children's books, as you can probably notice from our children's moments. And I love kids' movies. And I look up to Presbyterian minister Fred Rogers with something close to sainthood. It's why during seminary when I had an opportunity to attend a Children's Defense Fund conference in Tennessee one summer, I jumped at the chance. It was a week-long conference for people of faith to look at the plight of children in our rich nation. I knew what I was going to and what I would hear. None of the statistics or stories were new to me, and yet the experience was life-changing. People of faith, passionately worshiping and praying for the most vulnerable among us, children in poverty. The Children's Defense Fund has pushed for many policies over the years, fighting for children's well-being, education, health care, housing, and economic stability. And the work is inherently faith-based. It is because of their faith that they fight for children's needs and rights. And it is that faith that inspires this children's Sabbath weekend, when communities of all faiths are encouraged to pray for, consider, and be inspired to help children in poverty. And so it is with that goal that we approach today's scripture reading. The Holy One said to Moses, Go, up from here, you and your people whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt, and go to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it to you. I will send a messenger before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go up among you, or I would consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard these harsh words, they mourned. Hear what the Holy Spirit is telling God's children. 
When we meet again with Moses, he is being told by God to continue the journey to the land flowing with milk and honey. But Moses is also told that God will not continue with them. And the people mourned. What the people wonder is the point of continuing on their way if God is not with them. It is a fair question. It is God that led them out of Egypt. God that provided food and water. God that offered them instructions to live peaceably. God who forgave them. God who dwells and leads them. What progress can they make in the wilderness without God as their guide? They are in a desert, harsh, dangerous, isolating. They know where they want to go, but not how to get there. In an interview, child psychiatrist Robert Coles considers that We err when we try to create an illusion of a perfect world for ourselves and our children. They are witnesses to the fullness of our humanity. They are keenly attuned to the darkness as well as the light of life. And they can teach us about living honestly, searchingly, and courageously if we let them. Those of us who are parents and grandparents know the fullness of humanity, the joys and fears, frustrations and sorrows that come with children. But Coles was speaking of children in a more general sense. Even those who have never raised a child, even those whose children are long grown, are more richly human because the world has children. Children bring joy and laughter to the world. But children also show us the starkness of suffering. We know of torment and tragedy. We know of pain and poverty. But somehow children push us to witness that darkness with more sacred eyes. Children are the poorest age group in our rich nation. One in six kids in the United States of America today live in poverty, nearly three out of four of which are children of color. Five million children in our country live in what is deemed extreme poverty. Children, wandering in the wilderness, looking for stable housing, for stable food, for stable water, for stable education and health care. And a global pandemic has only exacerbated these concerns. We know the problem. We know where we want to go, but we wander the desert in search of the way. But the Israelite story does not end with the abandonment of God and neither does ours. Let us continue our scripture reading for this morning. Moses said to the Holy One, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let us know whom you will send with me. And you said, I have known you by name, and you have found favor in my eyes. So now if I have found favor in your eyes, Pray, let me know your ways that I may truly know you. See, this nation is indeed your people. God said, if my presence were to go with you, would I give you rest? Moses said, if your presence does not go, do not bring us up from here. The Holy One said to Moses, this thing you have asked, I will do. For you have found favor in my eyes, and I have known you by name. Moses said, pray, let me see your glory. God said, I will make all my goodness pass in front of your face. 
I will call out before you the name Hashem. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, God said, you cannot see my face, for no human can see me and live. The Holy One said, here is a place next to me. Stand on the rock, and when my glory passes by, I will place you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Hear what the Holy Spirit is telling God's children. The people know there is no moving forward without God. Liberation, nurture, covenant, confession have all happened, but there is still fear, darkness, still danger in the world. Moses begs God to stay with them. Moses intercedes to the Holy One on behalf of the people. Moses prays. There is an intimacy to the encounter, and God listens. God listens to the prayers of the people. God listens to the intercessions. God listens to the call for help. The future is not walled off. God is not indifferent to the needs of the people. No, Moses prays to and believes in a God who hears, who is present, whose goodness can be seen by the people. And this is not simply a spiritual or theological point, but a spatial and physical one. God is present with the people. As one biblical scholar points out, there is is a visible appearance of God in the center of this text that cannot be argued away. In prayer, Moses gets to glimpse God. In prayer, people see the goodness of God. In prayer, God is present with them in a very real and living way. Which is why today, this weekend, we pray for and advocate for children in poverty. Because we have a faith that believes in the power of prayer, that believes in the importance of faith-filled work, that believes all children reflect the image of God. We believe what we do in worship matters, what we say matters, what we pray matters. We believe in a God that hears our prayers and is present with us in them. So we pray for God's presence, for God's guidance, for God's goodness, For God's mercy, we pray we may glimpse God and that all of God's children may be led through the wilderness and into a more bountiful land. That Children's Defense Fund conference I went to was powerful for me. The atmosphere was convicting but optimistic. The speakers were illuminating. The discussions were rousing. The work was inspiring, but it was the nightly worship that was soul-changing. The style of worship was different from that which I grew up with. It was bigger and more passionate. It was loud and warm, and worship didn't end at the end of the service. In worship, we were being inspired to live our prayers, to pray for God's guidance and to follow God's back to a more bountiful land for our nation's kids. We prayed for stable housing. We prayed for stable nourishment. We prayed for education and health care. We prayed for intimacy. We prayed to God and asked for help to bring life to our prayers. And now we move into our own prayers of the people. Thank you. 
This is a prayer for children. We pray for children who like to be tickled, sneak popsicles before supper, and can never find their shoes. But we also pray for those children who stare at photographers from behind barbed wire, who can't bound down the street in a new pair of sneakers, who never counted potatoes, who were born in places we wouldn't be caught dead, never go to the circus, and live in an X-rated world. We pray for children who bring us sticky kisses and fistfuls of dandelions, who hug us in a hurry and forget their lunch money. But we also pray for those children who never get dessert, who have no safe blanket to drag behind them, who watch their parents watch them die, who can't find any bread to steal, don't have any rooms to clean up, whose pictures aren't on anybody's dresser, and whose monsters are real. Let's pray and accept responsibility for children who spend all their allowance before Tuesday, who throw tantrums from the grocery store and pick at their food, who like ghost stories and shove dirty clothes under the bed and never rinse out the tub, who get visits from the tooth fairy, who don't like to be kissed in front of the carpool, who squirm in church or a temple and scream on the phone, whose tears we sometimes laugh at, and whose smiles can make us cry. But let's also pray and accept responsibility for children whose nightmares come in the daytime, who lead anything, who've never seen a dentist, aren't spoiled by anybody, who go to bed hungry and cry themselves to sleep, who live and move but have no being. Let's pray and vote and speak and lobby for children who want to be carried and for those who must, for those we never give up on and for those who don't get a second chance. Let's pray for the children we smother, but also for those children who will grab the hand of anybody kind enough to offer it. Please grab the hand of a child who is being left behind. After each intercession, I will pray something like source of our transformation or strength or hope or comfort, and you may respond, make our lives a living prayer. Let us pray. O source of transformation, we turn our hearts to you on this children's Sabbath. We pray for the church that we may become an ever more true reflection of your welcome. Lead us in your, our witness to your justice. Teach us to be the embodiment of your love, especially for the youngest, impoverished, and most marginalized of your beloved children. Source of transformation, we pray. Make our lives a living prayer. Source of compassion, we pray for the world in which disease knows no boundary and suffering is a shared language. We ask that love will unite us in action that recognizes our common humanity. Give us your desire that all may live in the fullness of life. Source of compassion, we pray. Source of hope, we pray for our nation wounded by disease and death, division and distrust, pain and poverty, and so many uncertainties. Instill in us calm and trust in you that helps us reimagine our future with justice and joy for all children. Source of hope, we pray. Source of strength. On this Children's Sabbath weekend, we pray especially for the children and youth of our congregations and communities. We hold in our hearts those who struggle with disrupted learning, delayed plans, disappointment, and loneliness. We pray for those whose families struggle to make ends meet. We pray for you to lead us in work with our children toward your vision of justice and joy. Source of strength, we pray. Source of comfort, we pray for those who have died, especially those who died too young, too soon, from causes we could have prevented. We pray for those whose lives were lost to disease and despair, to brutality and bullying. Help us to be your arms of care for those who grieve 
and your voice to prevent unnecessary losses. Source of comfort, we pray. Source of community, we pray for those in our own congregation, all your children. We continue to pray for Carolyn Hoppus and her family. May they know your presence. We continue to pray for all those going through treatments for cancer. We pray for Marge Johnson and for her, fa her daughter, Marjorie. We pray also for Sue and her sister, Joanne, and her nephew, David. And for all those who are feeling overwhelmed by life in a pandemic. May they all know that they are not alone. Source of community, we pray. These things we ask in Jesus' name, who came among us as a living prayer of transformation, compassion, hope, strength, comfort, and community, and taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, 